so there is uh, there is so much that could be said and that I could talk about tonight about the Stephen Avery case and about making a murderer and about uh, Brendan Dassey, uh, the 16-year-old uh, nephew of Stephen at the time of the murder. Now he must be in his early 20s, maybe 24, 25. Um, and I will talk about a lot of that, but I also know that um, many of you probably want to hear certain things that I might not uh, have thought about talking about. So I'm wanting to leave a lot of time um, if, there, if there are certain things you want to talk about and for questions, because I do think that um, if most of you, and I assume most of you have either heard about this story or watched. In fact, how many people roughly have watched um, the series, the documentary Making Murder? Good. Oh, excellent. Okay. So um, you'll know the, the basics and you'll probably have a lot of um, feelings, strong feelings about it. Um, and you'll probably have a sense of um, maybe you, you think you know what happened. Maybe you do. Maybe you have a lot of questions that you don't know what happened. Um, and maybe you'll have your opinion about the justice system. Maybe you'll have your opinion about Manitowoc County. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, all kinds of things. So I don't want to just talk at you is what I'm trying to say. So it, it's a kind of a good topic to throw around and, um, and uh, to have you take advantage of me here on this case that really has uh, kind of gripped the country and even gripped part of the world. Um, in England and uh, elsewhere, even in, there's, our, my book is being translated into French uh, <laughs> right now. They, they're they're going to be publishing it there. So it's just this kind of case that even before making a murder, to tell you the truth, had such a strange feel to it um, from the very beginning. Um, from the, uh, the assault, uh, a brutal rape on Lake Michigan, close to where my wife and I live, um, 10 miles up the beach in Manitowoc County. Um, and making a murderer sort of glossed over the first case, which is really mostly what my book is about, which is the wrongful conviction case of Stephen Avery um, in 1985. I mean, if you're going to blame police and prosecutors, that's the one <laughs> where you can do that. And I wrote the book, The Innocent Killer, um, because as a prosecutor there years later, I became involved with the Wisconsin Innocence Project and the Crime Lab uh, when it was determined through DNA testing that Stephen Avery um, did not do the crime that he was convicted of. He sat for 18 years uh, in prison uh, for a crime uh, he did not do. So just think of the anger and what that does to a person. I mean, it's, it's just tragic. Um, tragic in a lot of ways. Tragic for Stephen Avery, of course, mostly, and his family, his wife, his marriage went down. She divorced him, Lori Avery, after sometimes children. You know, he never really got to know his children. Um, his, uh, the victim in the case, uh, Penny Burnson, who uh, was jogging along the beach. She was a physical fitness instructor at the YMCA and her husband ran a candy store in town, a touristy candy store in Manitowoc. Her life was turned upside down. Um, you know, she had doubts at some point. She went to the police. Are you sure we got the right guy? Every time there was an appeal, you know, the whole thing came back to her that I put this guy in prison. She was manipulated into identifying him, frankly, by the police. Horrible, horrible situation. And I'm a prosecutor, okay? I, I, I so, and I, I uh, and police have read my book, Police in the Manitowoc City Police Department, that, some in the Sheriff's Department too. But they have, um, most of us, okay, there are different views about prosecutors and police right now, and more power to that, but most police and prosecutors would be disgusted, and they are disgusted by what happened to Stephen Avery and by what happens on the streets sometimes. What I do believe, though, firmly is that this, these are exceptions rather than the norm. So because it was an exception and because it was such a horrendous thing that the police and specifically the sheriff and the district attorney at the time 
some wrongful convictions happen by mistake. They, they messed up. Um, they thought it was the guy. The, the witness uh, misidentified him, even though the police did everything they could to make it a, a fair process, identification process. Um, some other kind of evidence, there was a false confession or something. So the police, the prosecutor, really thought they were doing the right thing. Not this one. They knew within days of arresting Mr. Avery, at the very least they, they either knew or they recklessly disregarded the truth, and that is that he didn't do it. And not only that, that they knew who the real assailant was, a person by the name of Gregory Allen who actually made Stephen Avery look like a Boy Scout at the time. Mr. Allen was, was an extremely dangerous person. And uh, there are many people that approached the police and the district attorney. The district attorney basically lied uh, after we took the case to the attorney general in the state of Wisconsin for an independent review. He claimed that he thought Allen was on uh, uh, probation and he had an alibi. He, the police uh, DA staff came up to the DA and said, look, we think you got the wrong guy. Based upon all this other stuff, we think it's this Gregory Allen. And the district attorney says, no, no, we checked. Gregory Allen is on probation. And his probation agent tells, told me he has an absolute alibi. He was in this other city, I think, Kiwani at the time. In fact, Gregory Allen wasn't even on probation at the time. And I found a criminal complaint in the Avery file that indicated that the district attorney, the same guy who went after Avery, had charged and convicted Gregory Allen, the true assailant of a very similar crime on the same section of beach where Stephen Avery was convicted. So there's, I could go on and on and on, but suffice it to say that that case was a very clear case where the supposed good guys were the bad guys. Um, so, and I think that's part of why the American Bar Association published my book. It's part of why I think I've, uh, there's been some interest in what I have to say about it because I'm not just sort of a, you know, a tool of the state up here telling you that the police are always great, the prosecutors are always great. It's not true. Um, it's like anything in life. You know, you have really good teachers, you have some that aren't so good. You have really good janitors, you have some that aren't so good. You have really good lawyers, et cetera, et cetera. And the problem, of course, is with police and with prosecutors, um, you know, there's a, there's a real power, um, and some of it's unchecked, especially with police out on the streets. You know, there, there's an enormous amount of discretion they have, and um, there is the uh, there is the potential for a lot of abuse if they don't have it together in terms of what they sh should be doing. So if you see an example of that, which this case was, in my mind, you need to sort of call it out um, because it is the exception. I, I know, uh, you know, a hundred police officers by this time in my career and a hundred prosecutors, you know, and you could put on one hand the, the number who would be capable of this kind of nonsense. I really do believe that. But those that do can cause an enormous amount of damage. Um, so I think when it does happen, and that maybe is the value of making a murderer to some extent too, you know, you call it out, you, you don't hide it. You say, look, this is what happens when these guys do that. And, and for every wrongful conviction, people always forget this, every wrongful conviction the real assailant goes free right because they didn't get the right guy and in this case Gregory Allen the true assailant um, he went on within eight years after that who knows how many other crimes but eight years after we know that he broke into a woman's apartment in Green Bay as in Green Bay Packers okay uh, <laughs> and brutally raped the woman. Just a horrible crime. He's still in prison for that crime uh, in Wisconsin. Now, that crime would not have occurred. That woman would not have been victimized had the police and the prosecutor done what they should have back in 1985. That 1995 crime wouldn't happen. 
Stephen Avery wouldn't have been in prison for 18 years. Penny Bernson wouldn't have gone through hell, you know, over 18 years. And before I leave Penny, um, she is a person, she also wrote a postscript in, in my book, but she's also a person who, you know, some victims of crimes after what happened to her, and it was an attempted murder. I mean, she was nearly killed on the beach. Um, there's no point in going into the detail of how horrible it was, but it's about as horrible as a, of a rape as you can imagine. And um, she, uh, instead of sort of turning within herself and, and just for the rest of her life letting that experience define her, she defined the experience. She started going into prisons to work with defendants. She worked in wrongful conviction centers after Mr. Avery was exonerated. Um, she worked with victims. She was on uh, criminal justice boards. I mean, if there's a person that's kind of a, you know, a light in this whole thing, it would be Penny Burnson. So that's the wrongful conviction. That's the exoneration. So you move from 1985, the attack on the beach, okay, and the trial when Mr. Avery was convicted, and the book, you know, goes into how that could possibly happen with such little evidence. Uh, Stephen Avery had, I think, 16 alibi witnesses. He had a receipt from Shopko in Green Bay with the exact time stamp on it that would have made it virtually impossible to have committed the crime to get, put his family, his five children, into car seats and get them all up to Green Bay at the Shopko. So, yet the jury is still convicted. And some of that is based on something that making a murderer brought up, which is sort of a class bias. You know, he's from the wrong side of the tracks. And Penny Burnson and Tom Burnson, her husband, were from the right side of the tracks, totally the right side of the tracks. They were business people in town. They were church going. They were well respected. Penny's extremely articulate. These are smart, good, nice people that, that you would feel horrible about, uh, as a juror, sending Penny home after she told this horrific story over and over in court about this guy who attacked her and nearly killed her on the beach. And I'm talking nearly killed. When she came to, she was completely naked. She was dazed. Um, she was, first she was unconscious for quite a while. She crawled down to the lake, Lake Michigan, because he dragged her over the sand dunes. The first thing she wanted to do was wash her face because she didn't want her kids, who were down at the public part of the beach, to see her all bloody, you know, just as a mother would, you know. She almost, she was nearly killed. Um, and uh, it's only by, uh, you know, her husband came, the ambulance came, from four miles down the beach, rushed her to the hospital. She survived. Um, but uh, this is the kind of thing that can happen if you don't go after the right person. Because not only was she victimized at that point, she was victimized over and over again. Stephen Avery was the biggest victim, though. I mean, it's one thing to say that Penny Burnson was victimized, but let's face it, Stephen Avery is the guy that spent 18 years in prison. And the jurors, the jurors saw the Averys, and, and a few of the Averys might have exaggerated or lied to make it even seem better than it was the case. And once you do that, jurors are pretty onto that kind of stuff. And, and a lot of people think they thought up, oh, you know, they were making up this story about something else. Like I think the defense or the prosecutor asked, you know, you talked about this case amongst yourselves before, didn't you? You must have talked about the case to kind of get your story straight. Oh no, we never talked about. Well, you didn't talk about Stephen. You're his family. You never talked about Stephen and the case at all. And they all thought, well, if we say that, we're going to look like liars. So a lot of his family members said, no, nope, I never talked about it, never talked about it. Well, the jurors know better. You know, jurors can kind of spot. And, and they held that, and they held other things. But more likely, they just held their stereotypical view about what people are like against Stephen Avery. And they didn't want to let Penny Burnson, uh, to 
sent her home uh, thinking that the jury didn't care or that her assailant was now going to go free. You know, the, the trial, even the trial, the timing of it was even bad. It was three weeks before Christmas. No defendant, or actually sometimes no prosecutor even, wants a trial at that time. The last thing that jury wanted to do was send Penny home for Christmas, thinking that they didn't believe her and that the guy who nearly killed her is going to walk free. So there's that. And, and if we fast forward now to, to that whole experience, well, before we do that, I, I want to say one thing. When Stephen Avery uh, got out of prison, so it is fast forwarding a little bit, he did an interview with a Milwaukee Journal Sentinel reporter, uh, a guy by the name of Tom uh, Kircher. Uh, or actually, this was Bill Jans. I'm sorry, Bill Jans at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. And he, Stephen talked about what it was like to be in prison, um, kind of reminisced, you know, about the days when he was in prison. And he said, you know, I remember sitting uh, out on the, the uh, tables in the prison yard watching the jets fly by kind of just seeing way up in the sky these jets that would fly. It was almost like he was reminiscing, missing prison. He also told the reporter, Bill Jans, that some days he just couldn't take it outside. It, it just, it got to him. He'd have to take a drive. You know, I just had to get out and take a drive. Um, he lived for a while in an ice shanty. You know, uh, you know those little things where people who go ice fishing. Um, ice fishing, and, and the thought is, I think, he just couldn't get used to the space, you know? He needed the small confines of like it was in prison. So you look at what 18 years does to a person. Um, even if you're rightfully convicted, uh, 18 years can mess you up. I will point out, though, that, uh, let's see, six of those 18 years Stephen Avery did, he would have done no matter what, because he also was convicted, he pled guilty, to uh, an offense where he rammed his pickup truck into a woman's car. And this made it into making a murder or two, um, but they sort of whitewashed what really happened. Uh, in fact, Stephen Avery was a pretty messed up dude even before he went to prison the first time. Um, this is not a guy that, you know, he had some serious, serious uh, issues that he was dealing with, anger, um, abuse of animals, abuse of women. Um, on this occasion, he rammed his pickup truck into this neighbor's car, making a murderer sounds, made it sound like he was just, didn't know how to handle her spreading rumors about him, and that's what he did. Well, the fact is he had been stalking this woman uh, for months. He had been watching her with binoculars uh, as she got into her car in the morning. Um, he had uh, run naked across the car before, uh, right after she passed several times. I mean, he was a messed up guy, okay? He, after he rammed his pickup truck into her vehicle, um, she got out to check the damage and he approached her with a rifle and only let her go after she pointed out that her, I believe it was her infant son, infant son or daughter, I can never remember which, was in the car. And it was January, and it was Wisconsin. And the child probably wouldn't make it if he did what he wanted, take her, and very likely assault her. So he let her go. He pled guilty uh, to charges in association with that and got a six-year sentence. So you know, it kind of misses the point in some ways to say, well, he would have done six years anyhow. You know, you're not going to minimize the, the time he did for a crime he should not have done. But let's be kind of clear here, um, unlike the documentary. Um, this wasn't just a guy who, you know, was totally sympathetic, who was misunderstood, who never did anything wrong, um, and who only rammed his pickup truck into a woman's car after he stalked her for weeks and ran in front of her naked and held a rifle at her. That wasn't just, you know, kind of a mistake or a, the wrong way to handle 
her saying things about him. So there was an agenda, in my opinion, um, from making a murder. Um, it was incredibly well done. Um, it was something that you all know, you know, you, you just, it draws you in. It's something where uh, you think at one moment, I bet he did it. And then the next moment you think, no way, he didn't do it, he's innocent. And then the next moment, the next, you know, even a, a look of Avery, you know, you're looking at his face. Oh, he looks guilty there. You know, or he doesn't look guilty there. So it, it's, it was an artfully, skillfully done documentary. The problem is, from my standpoint, okay, I'm part of the system. Um, I'm still a prosecutor. When entertainment kind of mixes with news, which is sort of what this is, you know, it's, it's not quite journalism when you think about it. Journalism, at least journalism, used to have certain rules, the ethics rules of journalism, where, where it has to have, you know, a fairly close association with the truth, right? I mean, it can't be overly biased unless it's known to be biased. You know, if it's a talking head TV show and the whole point of it is that this is going to be a liberal show, this is going to be a conservative show, you expect bias. Um, and a documentary, you know, if it portrays itself, which is what the documentarians did, the two filmmakers, as being upfront, you know, we're, we invited both sides to talk, we're just, we're not, we're not taking sides, we're just presenting it as it happens. If you're going to do that, it seems to me, you have kind of a duty to be straight, you know, not to, not to pick a set. Especially when it's a court case that involves real people. You know, these aren't just TV actors. You know, Teresa Halbach and her family, her mother and her father and her brothers and her sisters, you know, who now think, know that half the world believe that the man who killed, who they're firmly convinced, because they watched the entire trial, are firmly convinced murdered their loved one, Teresa Hobart, they now know that half the world or more thinks that they got the wrong guy and that he's still out there. Um, the police officers, Two in particular, Andy Colburn and Jim Link. They were the two guys who were accused of the evidence planting, mostly the key. Remember, there was the key that fell, the police say, fell off behind the dresser and landed on the floor. Uh, making a murderer said, no, they planted it. It's obvious. Look, we have this video. The key's right there. The bookcase is right here. The bookcase is empty. Cops didn't see it before. And voila, the key's there. Obviously, Link or Colburn, who sort of got caught up in the wrongful conviction lawsuit and were deposed just like, I think, three or four weeks earlier, obviously, they planted it. You know, that's what making a murder, that's as far as they go. And if that's all you see, it's hard to walk away from that thinking anything but those two cops are dirty, they planted the key. You know, how can you not see that if that's all you saw? I can get into it a little bit, but we'll move on when there's questions. Um, and I'm going to move on to questions soon. And if, and if there aren't a lot, I'll get into some of the details. But I can tell you that there's another side that you didn't see. I can tell you, for instance, that when they took that video, the bookcase was totally empty in the center of the room. That video clip was from after they, the key dropped and the bookcase was moved. It, it wasn't that way when the key was found. Um, it was full of junk, full of books. And the police, which I don't believe making a murderer showed this testimony at all, uh, claimed 
and it, and it might, you know, people have to decide if that's baloney or not, their explanation. But it was an explanation, so it should have at least been in there. Said that when they were searching, those two cops had not volunteered to search. They were evidence techs, technicians from Manitowoc County. County Mac County did not have evidence technicians. Uh, they were asked to go there after the place had been searched quite a few times anyhow uh, to help document what was found and specifically on that occasion uh, to go through uh, some pornography magazines that Stephen Avery had in the bookcase. Uh, you might remember there was talk about leg irons and all kinds of junk that uh, Pot that Brendan Dassey seemed to suggest maybe that, that were used during the, during the rape of Teresa, and Stephen had purchased some things like that, and maybe the pornography would arguably be admissible in trial if that's the kind of stuff he was into. So they're going through that, and as the police testified at the trial, Colburn, one of the officers, is putting the junk back in there, kind of roughly, and in the back where the veneer, or not veneer, but like a particle board behind this bookcase, uh, came out and the key dropped onto the floor when it came out. And, and, and there was actually a picture of the particle board uh, drawn back somewhat from the uh, from the bookcase where it's separated. Um, now, people can say that's garbage. These two cops were dirty. These two cops planted that key. Whether they just thought, you know, it was Stephen Avery and we didn't have a strong enough case, whether they knew it wasn't Avery and they wanted to plant evidence to frame him again because of the $36 million lawsuit, whatever you want to think. But you should include both sides. You shouldn't specifically edit out to the point where you're actually splicing different words from different parts of the trial testimony to present something that's not true. I, I think and that's just one example of the kind of stuff that, you know, has to give you pause. One more example you might have heard of, um, it's easier to explain, is the cat burning incident. Okay, so on making a murder, they couldn't ignore the fact that Stephen had been arrested when he was younger for basically uh, a cat ended up in the fire. Okay, the way the documentary explained that, basically you get the impression he was horsing around with some friends when he was younger, they were kind of tossing the cat around, and the cat ended up in the fire. So the impression you're left with is it's probably when he was a juvenile, sort of an accident, maybe, you know, maybe bad friends, which is what he said. Well, the fact is he was convicted of mistreatment of animals, did 60 days jail. It was when he was 20 years old. He doused the cat with gasoline and threw it into the fire. Now, that's a very different version of that event than that was portrayed on the documentary. So just, just if you just kind of stop logically and think, even if in your mind right now you came away from that and walked away thinking, you know, he's just not a bad guy, he's a little slow, he's from the wrong side of the tracks, the police were upset because of the, they, they did what they did before and they were going to be sued and they planted evidence again, and we're disgusted with Manitowoc County. Okay, if that's the way you walked away from the documentary, which I think if I saw the documentary, I didn't know anything about it, it might be pretty close to what I think. But, but if you just stop and try to put away that emotion and that, that what you think you know to be absolutely true, and then you just say, okay, I know this because it was on a documentary. Now, can I trust the documentary? Ask yourself, if you look at how that cat burning incident was portrayed, can you trust that? You know, oh, it was just kind of a goof around thing. Nothing, if, if I recall right, nothing about gasoline. 
<coughs> the, the other incident that I think maybe would cause people to pause about trying to figure out if the uh, documentary was fair was the incident I was talking about before where he rammed his pickup truck into a vehicle, held the woman at gunpoint, was going to assault her, uh, had been watching with her with binoculars for weeks, running into the road in front of her, naked, stalking her. None of those details were in the documentary. When you're done with watching that episode of the documentary, you think this guy's the victim of some woman who's spreading rumors, and he just didn't know how to handle it. You know, he made a mistake. He shouldn't have bashed his car into her. So, you know, right there, and it's hard because our emotions tend to take over, and video is so strong, and audio is so strong, and it was so artfully done. The music was, you know, kind of foreboding and creepy. Uh, the police looked, as they often do, kind of stiff in their, you know, uniforms with their guns and, and nervous. Um, you got to really dig down deep. And if, if any of you are that obsessed, like I am, um, or like a lot of Redditors, people who read Reddit, um, or other social media, it's all online. You can actually read the transcripts from the trial. And you can compare them to the transcripts of this, the making of murder, because that's all online too. So um, you, can, you can sit there if you have, um, I don't know how many hours that would be, um, probably, you know, several months, uh, if you do two hours a day, maybe not quite that bad, but a lot, um, or you can maybe read a lot about it uh, online. You can go to Reddit, uh, there's people on both sides um, that will kind of parse out uh, for you. A quick story, and then I'm going to open it up to some questions. Um, the book I wrote took a beating. Well, it did both. First, it, it's, it obviously it got a lot of exposure after Making a Murder. I wrote the book long before there was a Making a Murder. Um, I wrote the book actually in 2008-9, and, and uh, the American Bar Association ended up publishing it in 2011. So it was like four years before Making a Murder. And I wrote it because I was ticked at what happened, at what the former DA did, what the former sheriff did, and a couple of other cops who kind of went along for the ride, knew what happened and didn't really care. I thought that was ridiculous, uh, that somebody needs to, to you know, write about that. And I took the position in the book without telling the reader uh, what to think, but it was pretty obvious, I think, that I thought he did the murder. You know, I still think he did the murder. Um, but people didn't like that who watched Making a Murderer. So shortly after it, I started getting some posts on my Facebook page, um, the Innocent Killer Facebook page is the name of the book. And they were nasty. I mean, they were ugly. Uh, they were, you know, saying, you're just a tool of the state. You're just an idiot. You're, you know, your book is garbage. Um, your, uh, what else was it, your lies, lies, and more lies. They actually, one person on Facebook encouraged the other people on his group uh, to write negative reviews on Amazon so that they could drive the ratings down, and they did. Uh, and I, it was a book that, you know, for like three years, it was a four and a half, four star uh, rating. People seem to like the book. The story is amazing. It's just a weird story. So it, it brought some interest and it brought a lot. As soon as Making a Murderer came out, it dropped down after 40, 50 negative reviews. And they were almost all the same. They were one stars. I never got a one star review before the show. All one stars. And they all said, they were like two or three lines, garbage, don't buy a book, full of lies tool of the state, etc. I mean, nasty stuff. And they took it down to a two and a half star uh, by basically sabotaging the book because they disagreed with what my position was. It's kind of a commentary beyond just 
this case to me. You know, do we even have the ability to accept others' opinions on contentious issues anymore? You know, the, the current political campaign suggests maybe we don't. Uh, and the and the the intersection of of media and entertainment and reality, like making a murder had might have something to do, might be interesting to compare to politics right now too. Entertainment and reality are becoming blurred. And what happens in the court system if entertainment or television or art starts to you know change what we how we've decided guilt and innocence for thousands of years based on you know constitutional uh, principles and rules of evidence to find the truth you know well where are we what if what if the next thing that comes out is convinced somebody is guilty but they didn't do it so are we going to have this kind of mob vigilanteism New York uh, Times uh, columnist, I forget her name, but in writing about mur making a murderer, she called it a highbrow vigilante justice. Um, that the two documentarians from New York put, decided upon their own that they were going to essentially accuse and convict, essentially, the police of of the worst kind of you know malfeasance or corruption you can have they they that's what they set out to do highbrow vigilante justice you know there there's a real danger in having these kinds of it, do we need it are there problems in the system that uh that these kinds of things help to expose i think it's crucial that's why i agreed to be interviewed in the first place with them i'm i appear really briefly in the first episode i mean Specifically, the Brendan Dassey confession has really troubled a lot of people. The young man who the police basically manipulated um, into confessing. Uh, it was troubling to me, too. I mean, I, I think uh, that case, by the way, is in the federal court right now in Milwaukee, uh, waiting for a decision on that very issue, whether his co uh, confession was so coercive that it should not have been admitted into trial. Now, um, Brendan Dassey was you know, cognitively limited, extremely so. He seemed like a nice kid. He didn't have prior convictions. Um, his role model was Stephen Avery, his uncle. You know, you're, you're, what do you expect? He, he, he's not, he didn't have a lot of advantages. Um, and the police, were desperate to get him to confess. It was obvious. And they promised him stuff. They manipulated. They lied. The, the way it works in real world law, most of that stuff is OK for cops to do, right or wrong. Cops can lie to get a confession when they interrogate. That's what the law is. Should it be? I, I think that you know that's above my pay grade, but uh, for somebody who has never dealt with the system and who's, for somebody who's got some real limitations, a 16-year-old who thinks even if he confesses to a murderer, he's going to go back home that day, I and mean, that's some pretty troubling stuff. So there's an example of where this documentary, I think, really can do a lot of good. It can get this discussion going, which it has, about, wait a second, do we want police officers to be able to basically you know, force confessions out of people. Is that what we're about? Or should there be some limitations where, you know, they can't lie to cops? It used to be the old days, they can't lie. The cops shouldn't lie. Why should the cops be able to lie? You know, the old days, it would be physical duress. Jam them up against the side and start, you know, threatening. But there's a manipulation, a kind of a psychological warfare that can go on by cops with people they're interrogating that is every bit as bad. And the court, uh, the Constitution does not permit that. So every case has its own facts. And what happens is you have to look at uh, how often has the interviewee, the person arrested, been 
in front of police? Do they know the system? Do they know how it works? Can they stand up to the police or not? And how bad was the police conduct? So it's a balancing trick, all that stuff. And that's what the court in Milwaukee is going to have to do on Brendan Dassey's case. Because if his confession suppressed, there's no evidence against Brendan. And he'll, he'll go free, which many people think isn't the end of the world. Um, he, you know, how dangerous is he really? Um, Stephen Avery's case is at a very different posture. Um, Kathleen Zellner is his lawyer from Chicago, a very uh, skilled, intelligent, very sharp lawyer. Um, has um, apparently um, a dozen or so, I think, um, exonerations to, to her credit. Um, is absolutely convinced, at least that what's what she says, that Stephen Avery is innocent and is tweeting stuff all over saying, you know, the cell phone pings off these towers prove that Stephen had left the Avery property and she was alive when she left and it's not Stephen, it's this person or it's this person and the forensic evidence, the scientific stuff was all botched up. And so she'll eventually file a motion for a new trial. And that will be a very interesting day. I expect that that will be sort of the next, I don't know, explosive moment um, in the in the 30-year Stephen Avery saga that started in 1985 on the beach. Um, but when she files that motion, um, and I'm sure it will be, you know, 50 pages or more uh, of all kinds of really interesting stuff. I mean, she bought a RAV4 of the same make and model and year of the victim so she could see exactly how things would stick, blood would stick, or hair would stick, etc., etc. She knows her stuff. Um, she gave a Newsweek article, uh, interviewed a Newsweek that showed up just yesterday on my Newsweek, and apparently she has a 3,000 square foot theater in her house. So she has been a successful lawyer over the years. <laughs> Very different than a prosecuting attorney in Wisconsin where <laughs> Governor Scott Walker has cut our pay. Uh, <laughs> so um, I want to open it up, if I can, for questions at this point. And uh, yes? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Documentary. Thank you. Uh, having watched the documentary, we are exposed to what was given to us, unless we invest more time to examine right. it. But going on what you said, yeah. it would seem that there has been wrongful conduct uh, by law enforcement in possibly both cases. Uh, certainly the first one, as you said, possibly improper actions by prosecutors in the juvenile's case, the defense attorney. And then my question is even the judge. And then that causes me to question the appellate court and the Supreme Court. So for the average citizen, what hope do we have that our system can be held accountable and that there would be retribution to those who have been unjust? Right. We tried. Um, with the first case, the wrongful conviction case, uh, my boss and I took it. My boss was brand new on, on the office and I had been there forever already and I kind of headed it up. So we uh, took it to the Wisconsin Attorney General when the first wrongful conviction happened and we started getting this, this information and all kinds of, yeah, a lot of information that, that it looked like there was misconduct on the part of the sheriff and our predecessor, uh, his predecessor, former DA. And um, so, I mean, we asked for an independent investigation, a review by the highest top cop in the state, you know, the Attorney General in Madison. And uh, she sort of reluctantly agreed to do an investigation and followed it up with a report um, about four or five months later. It was about an 18 page report and the first 16 pages of it were, were a lot of what's in my book, just jaw-dropping stuff about what the prosecutor did and what the sheriff did 
and what another cop or two did. It looks like, you know, you're reading there, you think, oh, those guys are in trouble. They're going to be charged with ethics violations, misconduct in office, you know, lots of serious stuff. The last page was taken over by the politicals. And it was the conclusion, the, the conclusion was, um, it was almost as if somebody else wrote that portion. And it was basically, and no ethical violations, no criminal violations, um, miscommunication, um, maybe a little, you know, short-sightedness or, or not being open to different uh, ways of looking at things. Total whitewash. And that's part of what upset me enough to write the book. Because had they been held accountable, first of all, the public, and, and I'll also say here, the media did a terrible job in Wisconsin on that. Because when they got that attorney general's report, they knew the facts, but they just took the conclusion like, well, no big deal. I guess the AG says they didn't do anything wrong, so they must not have done anything wrong. And you know what that causes down the road, of course, is all these ripple effects. Because if they're not held accountable, for one thing, Stephen Avery saw that. It's like, what? They did that to me? And so he had a feeling of kind of entitlement. Like, if they can get away with that crap after I spent 18 years in prison and they get nothing, I, you know, I don't care anymore. <laughs> and, that, and that, I think, was part of it. Um, and for the public, I, I, I think it is a problem that is not just, obviously, the Avery case the the police shootings this summer uh, or over the last year i mean there is a relationship between this every case does have to be looked at totally differently and i think there is a case where the media has helped you know and and video footage has helped i mean there's a few of those cases that are just so obvious that can't be explained away that the police and they've been charged there's some where you know people are going to disagree and, and the hope is that people can disagree um, peacefully. Um, and usually they have, it seems to me. But um, media can do that. The court system, at the same time this street stuff is going on, there have been a number of cases, um, especially in the, uh, I forget which circuit it is in San Francisco, 12th Circuit. Court of Appeals, the Federal Court in San Francisco, whichever one it is, and other ones, where they brought prosecutors in, and uh, in cases where there's been wrongful convictions, and they have, uh, you know, basically challenged them. How could you possibly still argue this guy did it? How can you, you know, justify possibly uh, that uh, your office didn't do anything wrong? You know, so there is sort of an anger building. There's been a lot of New York Times stuff about prosecutors and when they screw up. Um, rarely are they held accountable, though. You know, there's some lawsuits here and there. The U.S. Supreme Court uh, several years ago made it harder to sue prosecutors. Um, there have been some that have been successful. A prosecutor was jailed um, in Texas. He became a judge. A lot of prosecutors, by the way, who are involved in wrongful convictions go on to bigger and better things. Uh, a lot of judges, you know, were former prosecutors. Um, I always throw this caveat in there, though, because I tell you, it's a crazy system, whether it's on the streets or in the courts. People are hustling around, uh, doing the best they can in a messy, overloaded, um, imperfect system. But there is there is a real problem. And since 1989, when the first DNA test proved a wrongful conviction, uh, we're up to more than 350 now nationwide. And those are only the ones where there's physical evidence that could be tested. You know, Keith Finley of the Wisconsin Innocence Project, he calls that the low-hanging fruit, the ones that are easy because there's physical evidence. Most crimes, there is no longer physical evidence available that can be tested from way back when. Or a lot of crimes, despite what we all think from CSI and stuff, there isn't physical evidence in the first place. So there's a lot of people in prison who, did, who are there and they're innocent. There's no question. There's, you know, 
a million times more people who are in prison because they're guilty. <laughs> you know, it's, it will never be a perfect, perfect system. But if you have 350 known, proven wrongful convictions with physical evidence, you know, you, you definitely extrapolate that uh, to, to a number that's much greater because most of those cases don't have physical evidence can be tested. The numbers vary, you know, some people on one side will say, oh, it's 5% of the criminal convictions are wrong. Um, other people, Justice Scalia, before he died, uh, had done the math and sort of said, well, you know, you're going to have wrongful convictions, no big deal. You know, it can't be perfect, but at point zero 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 times however many, I come up with, you know, whatever number it was of wrongful convictions, a very small number. But I don't think Justice Scalia's way of looking at it is right. Um, you know, <laughs> and that, uh, <laughs> uh, I think one wrongful conviction is too many wrongful convictions. And most of them are not intentional, I will say that. Um, although they do, the Innocence Project statistics do estimate that police or prosecutor misconduct is at least some factor and I think it's like 45% of all wrongful convictions. That's a pretty high factor. It's not the only factor, but it's one of the factors. Did I? Oh, okay. Yes? How can your profession, you know, you've, you've now said that some of these prosecutors, you know, didn't do a good job. They, right. They had, they did wrong. How can your profession then, you know, persuade us cynics to sit there and say, okay, what's been done in the last 30 years? You still have your prosecutors going on to judges, and then they bring up the other people. And so it's, it's, it's a system that's just geared for failure, and you almost intimated that it's the media's fault. What has your profession done to stop that? Well, what I can't say right off the bat is, I guarantee you it'll never be perfect. Um, I guarantee you that um, there will never be a situation in, in this world where somebody won't be wrongly convicted. And I can guarantee you that there will never be a situation in the world where every state won't have uh, a handful of dirty cops and dirty prosecutors. Okay, so we got to, you know, decide where you're going to set the bar. Um, what can a profession do about it? The profession each, and that's not to say, oh, no big deal, we'll just live with that. It's just, you know, there has to be some realism about what, what is possible. That misses the point in terms of everything we have to try to do to make it better. Every state has a system, a legal ethics system. It's usually by the Supreme Court in that state. Um, and it's the rules of professional responsibility. And clients usually can go to the, 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 the people that run that and complain about what their lawyer did. Um, and then they can take away that lawyer's license. Um, criminal defendants all have appellate rights up, up and up, you know, that can go on for years and years, as they should, you know. Um, you're always going to have the way the system's set up in the United States and in England, this kind of pushback between prosecutors and defense between police and public defenders, between, you know, the system is set up, supposedly the adversarial system, where those two clash and the truth comes up. That's what the idea is. It's different in Europe, um, where they don't look at it that way. So there is, in the baked into the cake, kind of, um, an overzealousness by some prosecutors and by some cops. So that's hard to deal with. It mostly comes down to, and I, and I wrote about it in the book, um, you can come up with some rules. You know, we've changed the way we do identifications after the Avery case in Wisconsin, the Avery Task Force, and nationwide too, that, that these, some of the old ways of doing photo arrays actually led to identifications when there never should have been. So now you do it sequentially instead of all there at once. You have a different cop go through the, uh, the photo array than the cop who did the investigation. So it's called double blind, you know, so he doesn't know and he's not trying to hint to the person. The ethics part of it, 
I mean, it doesn't seem like it should be magic to me. If, if they're caught, you know, first of all, you got to allow them to be sued if it's intentional conduct, um, not if they mess up. I mean, I, I don't think, you know, people mess up. But if it's intentional, um, and there is some of that. There are, there, I mean, Stephen Avery was on the cusp of winning big, and he didn't sue just the county. He sued Kucerik, the sheriff, and Vogel, the DA, personally. So there's that, and then it ultimately comes down to what we do. We took it to the Attorney General. Well, the Attorney General, that's a cultural thing, that who is the Attorney General? In another state, maybe they would have come down hard. Uh, in another election cycle, maybe they would have come down hard. You know, So it, it comes down to, to some self-policing by the profession and by the courts and if the courts fail and the profession fails, well, then it's the public. I mean, it's pressure that people finally have kind of had, had enough. That's going on, I think, you know, it's a messy process. It, it is going on. And, and I do agree that this kind of TV documentary is needed. What, where I disagree and where I really personally, and not just personally, I think even the whole system doesn't benefit from is, is a kind of a manipulation of the truth and a conviction you know they're complaining about the a conviction of somebody just because they want to convict somebody it's almost like the same thing is occurring by the people who write the documentary we don't like what they did so we're going to change and and we don't even know what they did but we don't care so we're going to change the way this is presented to make it look like absolutely there's no question that these guys planted evidence is there tough issues, but um, it's probably not a very good answer. But yes. The, uh, a one-sided view, which is that Stephen Avery is innocent of everything, you know. Right. Um, could that be a response to the way most of our media, like, take shows like Nancy Grace and everything, how it goes the other way. And this person is always guilty. I don't think I've ever seen Nancy Grace say somebody was innocent, you know? So is it, you know, only fair that we should have media that presents the other side? Because I don't think we ever have before. Yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, I think you, you, the kind of media, even not just Nancy Grace, but sometimes the news media when there's a big trial going on and a murder case, and who do they talk to? Just the prosecutor. You know, and they take the side a lot of times of the state. This is the bad guy, you know, the defendant. These are the good guys, the cops. And Nancy Grace, it's to the extreme. I, I, we don't watch, we don't do Nancy Grace. Uh, but, you know, I don't, I don't know if to, uh, what's the word, to, to correct one wrong, you know, if, if you want to have your, okay, this is your pro-police, pro-prosecutor, hate criminal station, and, and this is, you know, this is your uh, cats are all bad station. I, you, you make a valid point. I mean, there needs to be both. I, I do think there's some other media outlets, though, um, some investigative journalism that can look at, at things that have gone on in different cases pretty, pretty carefully. And, you know, if police and prosecutors really mess up, there always has been some, someone out there uh, to, to point it out. I don't think, though, that we want to just say distorting the truth is fair game anymore. I, I don't. And, you know, it's so hard to explain because you really would have to either be at the trial or read the trial transcripts or spend so much time on social media to appreciate what I'm trying to say in terms of how this was uh, horribly one-sided. And if the police, you know, planted evidence in this case, um, I mean, I'm going to quit my job, for one. <laughs> but I, 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 I think that, um, you know, it just, 
when you, when you look at all of it and that you, you have to remember the, even the interviews of Brendan Dassey that was a three and a half hour four different interviews and the confession they actually used in court wasn't that one that was the the prosecutor knew that by that time what was going on isn't something he wanted to test Brendan Dassey gave statements before those two guys even talked to him and there were statements uh, at least one statement that he wouldn't have known about a detail that he gave so it, it's uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to, to I'm not even going to try I guess to convince people who who've only seen this uh, that they're that that it's not true I guess that's why I don't even want to necessarily say that I just want to say that what needs to happen is a realization that there's another side and they intentionally left it out in really obvious ways once you get into it. Yes? The um, Brendan Dashi interviews or interrogation. Mm -hmm. um, what we saw on the um, documentary, he didn't have a lawyer present when he was being interrogated. Um, as a 17 year old or 16 year old, however old, um, he's underage, so wouldn't he have to have at least a parent there or, you know, some representation? Right. Um, you know, he should have had, and also, right. too, because of his um, mental disability, mm -hmm. I mean, isn't there some legal rights that he has because of that issue? Right. Well, legally, the, the parents don't have to be there, at least in Wisconsin. Um, the police actually did ask the mother in that instance, um, and she said she's got to go to work, go ahead and interview him. Now, not real smart, but that's what happened. His lawyer, on the other hand, once he had a lawyer, for his lawyer to permit the police to interview him without him present, which is what happened. And that wasn't that the lawyer that was kind of working for the police and the prosecution? Well, yeah. It, prosecution? it was yeah. probably the thing that was the most disturbing in, uh, far, as far as the legal system goes. That lawyer sort of decided, you know, I know what's best for my client. He confessed, because he had already confessed, so I'm going to make sure he gives even a better confession so he gets a better deal. So therefore, I, I'm going to actually set up my own client, is what that lawyer was thinking. Problem is, his client was saying he didn't do it, that he made it up to the police. and. You know, especially I think disturbing, not only that he didn't show up for the interview with his client, his young client, but he hired his own private investigator. And you probably remember that scene where that guy, I mean, talk about an odd person, first of all, but a person who manipulated and sent on a guilt trip um, this poor kid. Um, so, yeah, it, there was, you know, that also is an ineffective assistance of counsel claim that will be coming back and will be discussed. Um, so that, you know, I would think at least at, at that point, um, when they look at that whole thing in Milwaukee Federal Court as to whether that confession should get in or not, all that they will be able to consider. But there's not an absolute right uh, that you have to have a parent uh, present. There is now a law in Wisconsin, I think a lot of states, that uh, confessions or police interrogations have to be videotaped or audio taped. And actually in Wisconsin, it's the first Avery case, the Avery task force that led to that too. So that's one improvement, I guess, in terms of improvement about the system that um, we can't use a juvenile confession unless it's videotaped. And if we try to use an adult confession in court, um, and it's not videotaped, even if the tape just wasn't working, there's an instruction to the jury saying, you know, the rule is they have to have it videotaped and it's not. And most police, by the way, like the fact that they're, that, that law exists. It protects them. We like it because it makes sure we know what's going on. And, and really, there's an awful lot of confessions that, that deal away with trials, to be honest. Yes. Uh, Mr. Griesbach, real quick. Oh, sure, um, sure. I just wanted to let everyone know we want to have time for a book signing, so this is going to have to be the final question. Okay.
Right. And so um, they didn't show it fully in the documentary, so that's why I'm asking. But her brother and that creepy ex-boyfriend, yeah. I'll just put that out there, <laughs> when they hacked into the accounts, like, were they ever brought in and asked? or Because that whole situation was a little weird, yeah. I'll be honest. <laughs> yeah. Well, the um, brother, Mike Halbach is the brother. Yeah. He, um, he sort of took on the role as the family spokesperson for the, for the Halbach. As to what they did, you know, the, the, um, their statement was they went into her phone because they were trying to find out where she went, who she talked to, and some things seemed to have been erased. Mm -hmm. And you can think, well, that's awfully strange. <laughs> were they things that might have embarrassed her that they got rid of? You know, I don't know. I'm not privy to that information. I can guarantee um, that, I mean, there is a line that you don't want to go past, I, I think. I mean, Mike Halbach uh, is totally devastated by his sister's death. The boyfriends, you know, everybody's saying could be this person, could be that person. There's a lot of speculation. There's some, you know, famous uh, person who uh, um, killed, I think, 10 other people. And uh, what's his name? Edward Wayne Edwards, I think. People are saying must have been him because he likes to set up people. Uh, must have been the creepy brother-in-law who uh, was going hunting. And there, there's nothing firm, and we'll see what Kathleen Zellner comes out at. But to believe Stephen Avery didn't do it, you have to ignore that he called Star 60. He did a Star 67 to hide his identity twice to Teresa on her cell phone because he had previously creeped him out because he showed up only in a towel. Um, you have to believe that the police planted his blood in her car, that they planted his, uh, her car key in his bedroom, that they planted bullets from his gun with her DNA on it in the garage, which is exactly where Brendan Dassey said that he shot her. Um, and you have to discount a whole other bit of evidence uh, that didn't get into trial, um, including that he had talked in prison about torturing women. Um, and you have to discount and assume, like making a murder did, that all those prior incidents um, were just sort of misunderstandings, that he didn't really have any problems, that when he rammed into that woman's car and held her at gunpoint, um, that was just kind of, you know, bad form more than anything else. So every time you think, okay, it could be this person, I think one thing to keep in mind is, okay, it could be, but then I better also keep in my mind at the same time all the other evidence, you know. So because to believe it's that person, it's so easy as soon as you assume that all the evidence is planted, you can always think it could be this guy could be that person. It's like a whodunit. Mm -hmm. But you have to look also at all the evidence that was there. I mean, how hard would it be for the police to do all of that planting? And what's the likelihood that Stephen Avery, who did have major, major problems right up to that point, including his girlfriend, Jody Stokowski, who he said, uh, who later said repeatedly that he beat her um, he wanted to have uh, sex with her and, and do all kinds of things in the way that he ended up torturing Teresa Halbach. If you look at her interview after the fact, I mean, there's just an enormous amount of evidence that you have to totally discount while you're speculating about this other person. I'm not saying it's not worth the time, but all I'm saying is when you're speculating without any real physical evidence or anybody that says, I saw that person do it or that's the motivation, um, you should also keep in mind, I think, well, what, what does it look like? What does my speculation that that person did it versus all of this other evidence that he did it, you know, how does that fit in? Because it's really easy to me, anyhow, to, uh, to just let speculation take over. Okay, well thank you all for uh, being here.